Um, I thought about, you know, talking about catastrophizing. I think that's a one that's that's really common. Um, so it's to blow things out of proportion or to think about, you know, all the possibilities of what could go wrong, you know, all the what ifs, all the worst case scenarios. Um, and I have two examples that I want to share. The one is, you know, when you and your partner maybe have a bit of conflict and your thoughts might be, what if my partner leaves me? I will never find anyone else. I will never be happy again. I will probably die alone. So you can really <laughs> hear the spiral yeah. around these thoughts. Or it can be something like, um, I'm going to fail this exam. I'll be kicked off from university. Um, it's the end of my career. I will never be successful one day. Welcome back to another episode of Inside Your Head. I'm your host, Christelle Roots, clinical psychologist and founder of Psych Central South Africa. Um, today I'm going to have a really interesting discussion with Lisa van der Waalt. Lisa is one of our psychologists here at Psych Central. She's a counseling psychologist and she works mainly with adults. She sees a lot of people who um, struggle with anxiety, with depression. And so we discussed and we thought that this is a really important topic to talk about thinking about your thinking. It's something that we do automatically. It's conversations that we have with ourselves the whole day, every day, but we don't even recognize. And so Lisa, I'm really excited for us to chat about what people need to be aware of for us to really understand how our thinking actually impacts our emotional state, our behavior, mm -hmm. our relationships, just actually everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's have this discussion and see where it goes. And um, I'm very excited for you to be here. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Gersdal. It's nice to be here. Lisa, but so maybe just tell me a bit about why this topic is important to you or what made you think about thinking about your thinking? Okay, so this topic is very close to my heart as I, I started to realize the importance and the essence of your mind, how your thinking patterns and some of our thoughts can really put us down in the dumps. Like you can be your own worst enemy or your own best friend. And that's the power of your mind. Um, and also I started to notice like how it plays out in my own life, but also in my clients. And yeah, I just need to wait for the right moment. But I get so excited inside because I want them to know this stuff and like how perspective can change the situation drastically. Um, I actually want to start off by asking you like, Chris, have you ever watched a movie that really made you feel something? Yes. Yeah. So of course. So you maybe felt like the fear as the camera goes underwater in the sea and you just get a feeling that a shark may show up at any time or anger when that bad guy gets away or that joy when everything turns out okay. So it seems obvious that movies can make us feel something, but why? Because we are not actually in the ocean and the victory isn't really ours. But the answer is as simple as this. It's like being in the ocean doesn't cause the fear. It's what you think about being in the ocean alone that causes the fear. So in short, it just shows you how your thoughts have the power to control your emotions. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a beautiful example, Lisa, because it, it really shows how you don't have to be there to experience it. We've exactly. all cried in a movie. We've all felt devastated. We've all felt extremely terrified and scared. But you even, even in a movie, it's more obvious that you're not in that situation. Yes. But our thoughts are so powerful of how it would be mm -hmm. for us to be in that situation. In that situation. Yes. Which is, yeah, that's... That's so powerful to think about. Yeah, and that's all in the, like the power of the mind mm -hmm. in that. Um, and it also made me think around like, you know, again with two people in the same situation, how they can have a different emotion experience or behavior around that. Like I actually thought about the example of, you know, having two people having to attend the social gathering. So the first, person A might, might feel, you know, extremely excited around this, where person B might feel, you know, a lot of anxiety around that. And that's kind of where we need to pause for a moment because we need to ask, like, why is this person feeling that 
you know, excitement or anxiety. So it's kind of like asking person A to tell me exactly what they are thinking. Um, And that might sound something like, I'm so excited. I can't wait to get a catch up with these people. I'm going to wear my new jeans and something nice with that. While person B might have, you know, a whole nother thought train around that, you know, thinking something like, why, like, what if I humiliate myself or I stutter or they will think I'm dumb or what if I don't know what to say and they'll think I'm boring. So now you can start to see like how, what's that link between your thoughts and your feelings? Elizabeth, so tell me a bit about why is it that people have different experiences? Why is person A so okay and person B feeling so different and having these, I want to almost say intrusive thoughts or just very different experiences? Yes, so that's the thing, it's the thoughts. So now we need to, you know, stand a bit still and become aware of this. We need to start thinking about our thinking. Um, so with that, I, I I'm going to say something that might shock you a bit, but it's to not believe everything you think because not all our thoughts are true. Um, so what do I mean by this? I mean that some of, some of our thoughts might be facts while others is just an opinion or an assumption. And in Afrikaans, we say like, um, kijk wat hy doge doen. Like, um, you know what they say about assuming and that's yes. the thing. Mm. Mm. And I think that that's so important because we often think about that in relation to other people, but not necessarily that we are doing that ourselves yes. as well. So we also make assumptions about ourselves. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Lisa, but so maybe tell us a bit about if we think about thoughts there's there's also these different i want to say level of thoughts so there's the like the the initial thought that you might have but there's also what you would refer to as automatic thoughts and how that or the the beliefs that someone have mm-hmm. how does that impact or i almost, almost want to say where does that come from that for example person B might be thinking, but what are these people going to say about me? I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be um, rejected or people are not going to enjoy this experience with me. What makes it different for people? Well, the thing is when you go deeper into your subconscious or more, like it's very unconscious. So I think that's why the whole thinking about your thinking might be, you know, a challenging experience or overwhelming in the beginning because we need a lot of deeper information to to really get to the core of where this comes from. But just underneath where we start to identify our thoughts, just a bit deeper, we start to set up these rules and assumptions due to past experiences where you maybe have a rule where I must be perfect and then your assumption might be that if I'm not perfect, then I'm a failure. And then you go even more deeper where, you know, that core belief where your worth starts. Um, I mean, relationships and performance has a real like influence on your worth. And, and the thing that all us like want to protect is that we want to feel worthy so in everything in our being is we want to try and protect that and then we start with you know with rules and assumptions um to you know kind of protect that so it's this whole thing around being good enough versus not feeling good enough or hopeless or helpless even. So that's like we, with this whole process about thinking about your thinking is to delve deeper into what that core belief of or that core belief that you have. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's like kind of the deepest level where we want to get through. Okay, too. And I think it's so so important for people to understand that that there is so much that we are thinking that we are actually not aware of, yes. and that's just automatically happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I, I like the word that you use, that there's all of these rules that we also have, because I think we don't recognize how early on we already develop these rules and these ways of thinking definitely and so that's also why it's sometimes so difficult for people to make sense of Mm -hmm. is 
like a lot of the assumptions that you have or rules, you came up with that when you were six years old. Yes. And so actually it doesn't make sense. But you're still following that because that made sense to you at emotionally that at that time. And mm. like the other day, someone said to me, we were speaking about emotions, another psychologist, and, and I've actually used this example so much with some of my own clients where we don't recognize that almost the severity of mm. how much we avoid that rejection. I keep on <laughs> doing that. Sorry. How much we avoid that rejection yes. because you, as a, as a very like young human being rejection equals death yeah and so we avoid rejection to mm -hmm. the same extent that we would avoid death yeah which wow. is actually it's so so intense to think of yeah wow yeah that's something to think about mm. like it makes a lot of sense mm. and i think that's where like the everything in you wants to protect that um, and that's where, where that rules and assumptions come from. Mm. Um, but sometimes they can work against you and not for you. And that's where the challenging part comes in mm. with this. Mm. Mm. Tell us a bit about some of the, the mind traps that people can fall into. And maybe I guess that that's where it's not working for you, but it's actually working against, against you. you. Yes. So I kind of want to share a quote that you know, take me exactly to the understanding of mind trap. So it's one of Albert Einstein's quotes. And he said that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created that. Um, and I also want to add on this quote because sometimes the problem is not the problem, but maybe it's the solution to the problem that is the problem. Like, Sometimes you need a hammer instead of a spanner to really solve this problem. Mm. So it's kind of like my understanding around a mind trap. So you need to kind of challenge that and become aware of certain traps you fall into and how you can, you know, try to think differently or in a more alternative way to work for the best for you, to be really your own best friend. So I thought about um, there's like... A lot of mind traps or unhelpful thinking styles but I thought about like sharing what I think the most common ones mm. are mm. okay so I thought about you know let's talk about all or nothing thinking and it's also called the black and white thinking so just to give an example before I, I try to explain this more is is when someone would tell you like I only achieved 70% I am such a failure or I'm always wrong. Okay, so with that in mind, the consequence of that mind trap is that your thinking is very rigid. It's either everything or it's nothing. So this mind trap, um, mind trap traps you in being either this or that. So there's no in between. And to counteract this mind trap, it's it's really to find that shades of grey to become become comfortable with the gray areas it's not we're not speaking about you know laws we're really like speaking about your own rules your yeah. own thinking around that so you know it's to ask yourself am i being extreme or rigid now um is there like an in-between where things are not perfect but also not a disaster um so so just to go back to the examples I gave, um, it's it's kind of to find the gray areas in there with something like, it can sound like, you know, 70% is good. It's really a good mark. Um, and I didn't fail my test and assignment and I, I did above average, which is really a good achievement. Or with the example I gave with, I'm always wrong. I mean, are you really always wrong? I mean, there might be times where you're actually right or do things where you're good at. So it's really to find that, you know, comfortability in the gray area. Mm -hmm. I want to play a bit of like devil's advocate because I'm just thinking this is what a lot of my clients would tell me. What if you failed? What if you didn't get... So, so there's a difference, obviously, when you're saying... Um, I'm maybe getting 70% and I'm feeling like I failed mm -hmm. and realizing that actually you did quite well. But what if you, if you did shitty? What yeah. if you actually 
got 30 percent well that what they are that's a good question i always get this picture of you know a, a pizza and it's kind of like i explain to my clients that when a slice of avo falls off i mean the whole slice won't be bad like mm. you can still enjoy the pizza and it will be good and i kind of see it in this way as well like let's say you failed it doesn't mean you are a failure mm. um so again it's just to become you know to see the middle ground that okay i did you know poor in this taste but i as a human being am not a failure i will try my best the next time um and also you know then you, you will have to deal it's harsh to say with the consequences around that because maybe you need to rewrite or maybe you mm. need to redo a year but it's just you know, to find that gray area that you are not a failure. You failed in the test. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. Let's chat about the second one that you have there. Okay. Um, I thought about, you know, talking about catastrophizing. I think that's a one that's that's really common. Um, so it's to blow things out of proportion or to think about, you know, all the possibilities of what could go wrong, you know, all the what ifs, all the worst case scenarios. Um, and I have two examples that I want to share. The one is, you know, when you and your partner maybe have a bit of conflict and your thoughts might be, what if my partner leaves me? I will never find anyone else. I will never be happy again. I will probably die alone. So you can really <laughs> hear the spiral yeah. around these thoughts. Or it can be something like, um, I'm going to fail this exam. I'll be kicked off from university. Um, it's the end of my career. I will never be successful one day. So again, a lot of worst case scenario thinking. So the consequence of this mind trap is that it leads to more anxiety. Um, you catastrophize the consequence and you believe that it will happen. It's just a matter of time. But have you ever like have these catastrophizing thoughts and you realize that 90% of them really never, you know, come true. Um, yeah. So that's the thing around this. So it's really to counteract this mind trap is to put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do that? Um, you can ask yourself, like, what's the possible outcomes for this situation? You know, look at, you already maybe looked at the worst case scenario, but look at the best outcome and also look at what would be the most likely one. Um, and to ask yourself, um, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself to really just, you know, take a step back and put things in perspective. So to go back to the examples I gave, it, it can maybe sound something like this, like how likely is it that my relationship is not going to work out and that I really will die alone? Um, so that's probably your worst case scenario thinking and your best outcome will be that I will be happily married one day and the most likely outcome will be well we'll we will sort out this conflict and we we will be happy again so it's really to take a step back and look at the situation mm -hmm. and also the one with the exam is to you know ask yourself how likely is it that i'm going to fail this one exam and that they will kick me from university i mean maybe you'll just have to rewrite or you know maybe worst worst case scenario is to rewrite but the most likely outcome will be that you will be successful one day it might just take a bit longer mm -hmm. I can relate with this one so much and that's why I laughed <laughs> when, when you when you gave that example of I'm going to die alone. Um, it's not because I'm laughing at the fact that that's something that people experience. It's because I can relate so much and I think yeah. that that goes back to uh, it kind of links with the black and white thinking and I think that a lot. probably a lot of times we experience multiple mind traps um, at, at, a time. At, at a time because I would often have this experience of I can't tolerate someone being angry with me because it's going to be like the worst case scenario and I'm not going to the relationship is not going to survive it mm -hmm. but that that then means that you really also look at things like someone can't love me and be angry with me at the same time mm -hmm. so because you see it so black and white yeah. you would probably be more likely to catastrophize yes that's true. That's true. Most likely, most of us fall into a few mind traps. There's mm. not necessarily just one. Mm. Yeah. Which makes it so tricky. A lot. 
a lot overwhelming, a lot more challenging. And, and I always tell my clients when we discuss, you know, these type of things is it's not that you should have known about this. This is why we talk about this is to become aware. It's a new skill. So in in that self, it's it's challenging. So be kind to yourself towards working through this and and you know gathering new information around that don't beat yourself for not knowing Mm. um because i had to learn this and that's why i thought well this is a great discussion to have to create more awareness around the process of your mind and how you can go about that Mm. Mm. yeah lisa what's the the third one that you want to mention okay so the third one is also a very common one it's the jumping to conclusions so there's two key types of jumping to conclusions and the one is you know mind reading and the other one is fortune telling but Mm. i want us to talk a bit about mind reading okay so mind reading is when you imagine you know what the other person is thinking So, for example, you might, you know, be in a conversation with someone and have the thought of, they think I am stupid. So, the consequence of this mind trap is that it leads you to assumptions and you know what they say about assuming. So, this can really have an impact on your relationships, on your performance even, because you are so much in your head trying to figure out what the other person is thinking. Um, So to counteract this mind trap is to not guess, okay? So it's to ask yourself, how do I really know this? What are some alternative explanations for this? Um, And to go back to the example of they think I'm stupid, you know, tell yourself like, hello, you can't read their minds. So you, you, what, who knows what they are thinking? So, it's, it's really, again, to take a step back and to not be so hard on yourself. Maybe they do enjoy you and maybe they do like you. Maybe they just had a bad day or, you know, have a lot on their mind. Mm. So, again, that assuming can really get you into trouble. Mm. I just also think that we often struggle to get out of the mindset of, And I don't mean this in a horrible way, but not everything is about you. Yes. (laughs) So, again, if you are in this mind trap, you're going to assume, like, whatever this person is doing must be as a result of how they're feeling towards you or what they're thinking, where it might just be that it's completely random and that it's actually they had a bad day at work or someone was just rude to them or they were very stressed and it's got nothing to do with you at all. (laughs) That's so well said, Griselle. Like, yeah. I'm saying that because I, I do it myself. Let's, <laughs> if we talk about the fourth one and I also match that one, then I'm going to be like, I need, I need twice a week therapy, not only once a week. But um, <laughs> tell us about the, about the, the last, next one. Okay. So I think this is the last one I think I want to talk about with the mind traps is disqualifying the positives. Um, it's where you discount the good things that have happened or that you've done. Um, so, for example, it's that thing where, where you would tell yourself that I passed the exam because it was easy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so the consequence of that mind trap is that you do not give credit that actually deserves it. Um, and this can put you in a complete state of not feeling good enough, um, not feeling worthy, Um, also you know feeling hopeless because nothing ever you know there's no arrows pointing to you it's always like pointing outside always want to achieve the next thing the next thing but you never stand still and you know celebrate the small victories so to to counteract this mind trap is to acknowledge the good and to ask yourself am i downplaying or ignoring some evidence and what are the good things in the situation because we if we go back to the um, previous example it's a thing of you know you can tell yourself i passed the exam because i studied hard because Mm -hmm. even if you haven't studied and the um, exam paper was easy you probably would not have been able to you know pass and so that's the thing of really you know giving yourself the credit where it's actually deserved and not downplaying or disqualify that why would people do that though where does that come from potentially yes i think it's again you know very deep rooted 
in the in the subconscious or in the unconscious we have this core belief of you're not good enough i'm not worthy to have a compliment i'm not worthy to you know give the credit to myself and because you have this firm belief deep down inside you that you are not in good not good enough you're not mm-hmm. worthy for this so i think that's um maybe where and you know it's just my opinion but maybe this is where you know self esteem problems you maybe also plays a role where it's so difficult to take a compliment because you feel like you don't deserve it so you would either just you know turn your back or be uncomfortable with that don't like it and and again that's where the disqualifying mm. of it comes in mm. Mm. i think it's important um just for people to also understand and and that's why i'm asking this question and i i understand that it's different for each person so it's obviously not the same yes um it's not like there's three reasons why people can feel this way True. and and maybe sit with some of these mind traps i think some of these mind traps might be because people struggle to they never were taught how to regulate their emotions mm-hmm. and so that might be as a result of that that they catastrophize or that they um prepare for the worst case scenario um it might be as you say also these rules that people have for themselves um but i think that there's a big part that's also affected by how we interact with other people definitely and so if you grew up in a very critical um environment or if you were in a long term relationship where that person was very critical or very harsh um maybe i want to go to the extreme of saying emotionally abusive mm-hmm. those are all things that would give you these messages yeah um and so if you're listening to this and you are saying okay well i i see that i'm doing this i think it's so important to to really be thinking about your thinking and not to judge yourself about your thinking yes. because you didn't just wake up and start thinking these things no you developed it as a result of how your environment made you feel mm-hmm. the messages that you got from things which might sometimes be the wrong messages it might not actually be what people intended true but it's still like i think just that empathy and that understanding for yourself mm-hmm. is really important for people to have 100% um and it, it, something that came to mind is the thing of it was all there for us to protect us in that moment um it's all of those key learning experiences that we had mm-hmm. um but it doesn't have to stay that way I, i sometimes get this picture of you know we can't change your story but we can change the background music and we can make it you know lighter for you by by becoming aware of certain things that doesn't work for you anymore mm. Lisa if if we think about these mind traps um how does this present itself in people's mental health like what would it look like if you or what can it potentially mean for you like mentally if you are stuck in some of these mind traps Well I think like I've mentioned with a catastrophizing it can really put you in a place of anxiety and the mind reading it takes me to you know maybe triggering social anxiety for not enjoying the gathering but being so in your mind about what you think they are thinking about you so and again also with um the all or nothing or the disqualifying the positive it can put you in a place where you know you experience that of i'm not good enough i'm feeling worthless um putting you in a place where you really feel so low maybe depressed in a way mm. so it does have a direct influence on your mental health and your well-being mm. so if someone's listening and they're going actually i can see that i'm doing a lot of these things you've you you you've given some kind of tips with each mind trap of what they can be doing and and or what they should do to maybe challenge this a bit but obviously we are also human beings and we mm-hmm. can't just it's not a switch yes where do you suggest to people start or what are things that people i don't know it, again there's not a one size fits all but yes. what what do you think should people be aware of or think of mm-hmm. um that can be a starting point for them to address some of these things. Okay, so I'm going to try 
to keep everything as simple as possible for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really the process of trying to not let that automatic negative thinking stand in your way. Um, and, and it's called a process because it's not a quick fix, like you've mentioned. Um, there's no recipe. You need to really stand a bit still, work through this, become aware, identify your thoughts. So there's a process called check, challenge, and change. Okay. Okay. So with the check um, part, this is where you start. So you, you identify your thoughts to really become cognitively aware of what you're telling yourself. So most likely there would be a situation happening and you will ha you will experience a strong feeling towards that. But then it's important, and I always tell my clients to, to kind of imagine someone putting a microphone in your head. Like it literally just gives all the fleeting ideas and the information directly. So what works nicely is sometimes in the situation you aren't able to go there because it's too overwhelming, you're not sure where to start, but after a day, try to reflect on a piece of paper, um, you know, try to ask yourself what was the situation, what was my feeling, and then, you know, imagine that microphone in your head and literally write down every, uh, you know, thought that went through your mind. And then with that, um, you can start to become aware of certain mind traps maybe that you fall into um, and, you know, see if there's a catastrophizing or all or nothing thing that's, that, that was maybe a thought there. And then it takes me to the next step of trying to challenge your thought. So you evaluate your thought and you ask yourself, what is the factual evidence for and against your thought. So I usually also tell my clients to imagine themselves being in a court, okay? To think about like how they would represent themselves. So they have to think of factual evidence that this thought of, uh, of them is 100% true. So what evidence do you have that back this thought and then you look at the flip side of the coin um, and then you ask the same about what factual evidence do you have that this thought is not a hundred percent true um, and and also with the counteracting questions that are um, previously stated you can use that with the specific mind traps as well to get more clarity and then it takes me to the last step where it's to change your thought so there you would start to see that um, you know what the alternative explanation might be or maybe you will start to notice that there's another way of looking at the situation or something that's very practical is to you know ask yourself if your friend was in the exact same situation what advice would you give them because we are more kinder towards a friend um, and yeah. more objective advice than we would um, be towards ourselves or give ourselves mm. yeah mm. so that's a check challenge and change process that you can you know work around with thinking about your thinking identifying your thoughts try to challenge them see where your mind trap that you maybe fell into and then how can you look you know in another way or an alternative way or like I've mentioned, if mm. your friend went through the same thing. Mm. Yeah. I think that that's really helpful, Lisa. I do think, though, that people need to <clears throat> just also remember that sometimes it can be really hard to do this by yourself. True. And so while I, I don't want to be advocating for everyone needs to go to therapy, mm -hmm. that it is useful to check this with an external source. 100%. Because it, it can be so hard to be your own voice of reason. And sometimes yes. that's a part of what therapy, the role that therapy might play is that someone recognizes, okay, I'm hearing this from a stranger and an objective person mm -hmm. and so then I can acknowledge that this is actually something that I'm doing true but to call yourself out and to check the facts for yourself when you are already in this emotional mind mm -hmm. can sometimes be challenging and it's not saying no one can do this by themselves but if you notice that you're struggling with a lot of these things it can be so helpful to allow yourself yeah. the space of I'm bringing this to someone and they're helping me to work through this process um, Definitely. because 
you're going to repeat it over and over and over and over again mm-hmm. until you're doing this less. Yes. And and I think that's very important what you said because I can just imagine, you know, being fully in a all or nothing it's so difficult to get Mm. that gray area so you might just need a sounding board or you know something with a different perspective um to really help you there because i think if you so a hundred percent believe that um it's like you're hitting a wall then the whole time and you might feel you know a bit stuck Mm. so you know i think there's nothing wrong of just you know asking for Mm. for help around that are there more mind traps, Lisa? There are. There's, um, I think, around 10 most common ones. Okay. Um, so we can maybe, you know, think about mm. a follow-up mm. um, discussion around this. Yeah, or as we said, maybe you can write us a, a blog where we can yes. share some of this and people can go back to um, mm. for them to have just some resource of, I'm sure... If I think about myself, I might actually come up with more ones because they might be combinations <laughs> of ones. So we'll have hybrid mind traps that, that you actually experience. But yeah. but I think it's useful for people to just have some resources of yeah. yeah I'll reference. definitely do the block thing. Um, and also to help them, you know, with sitting more around the thought record thing to mm-hmm. really, you know, have a few probing questions that can also add that thinking process on the go mm. um, so yeah I think that's a great idea to also share that to have more material and to really you know engage with it mm. um, and to see do you struggle do you you know get it the first time or, or whatever yeah. the case might be yeah. yeah okay Lisa thanks so much for this conversation and thanks for sharing these very practical examples I'm sure that people listening would be able to fit themselves within one of these scenarios or really be able to relate and to Mm -hmm. find it useful and and i think that that's the thing to also just remember is that probably everyone has some mind traps um it's not detrimental if you have mind traps it's not the like you won't be able to recover from it but it's something that we need to work on and Mm -hmm. that we need to find help um to change Mm -hmm. so yeah it's 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 very meaningful and very valuable i think to a lot of people so thanks for putting yourself out there and for being brave enough to come and um, for just sharing this with me thank you for having me christelle it was nice cool thank Thank you you. if you enjoyed this episode please make sure to follow or subscribe on your desired platform i will be so grateful if you're willing to take the time to rate this podcast so that you can continue to learn more about various topics related to your mental health and well-being.